wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen, friendly old girl of a town. Neath her tavern light, on this merry night, let us clink and drink one down. This is the place to clink and drink several down, Copenhagen Harbour. And Arvid Müller, who wrote the song, must have been thinking of the pretty girls who pack the harbour bars, blonde, tall, slim and friendly. I only know this as some of my film crew told me at breakfast, by the way. But this is a very lively place. The streets are packed from early morning till early the next morning, as I found out to my cost. A short bike ride from the harbour is Christiana Freetown, and free it is for the lovers of certain substances. For hashish is sold openly in the market area. Of course, we were told not to film the dealers or else. And the police let the trade flourish, although it's not strictly legal. My latest chum, Peter, has lived here with his wife and two children for 20 years. Originally from London, he runs a stall selling hashish pipes. He regularly smokes various substances, but still manages to remain standing. Peter likes the community spirit that exists between his fellow drug users and wouldn't leave the place for all the hashish in the world. There are many of you who watch my programmes who think I'm slightly right of Vlad the Impaler, and so you might be wondering why I'm in this amazing commune, a unique village within a city of wherever we are, Copenhagen, where everybody indulges in certain substances with the full blessing of the government and everybody. Now, I have no view on that at all. I certainly drink the odd glass of scotch. I certainly drink more than my fair share of red wine. And I also smoke quite a few cigarettes. It's my life and that's how I want it. So we make no observation about this place except it's very happy, they're having a wonderful time, and we're enjoying ourselves here. We've made us very, very welcome indeed. That's a joke. That is seriously a joke. <laughs> Can't touch the stuff. Not really. But something to be said, which I shouldn't be saying, is here, anybody tries to get in with hard drugs, they are beaten, thrown out, sent naked back into the streets, and their drugs are destroyed. That is their way of life. That's how they police it. It's for you to judge, not me. I'm a cook. Well, I used to be a cook, till I discovered <laughs> other things. Anyway, fine fish, halibut and salmon. We're going to poach in a little bit of fish stock, flavoured also with celery, carrot and parsley. And this will only take a few seconds, because we want the fish to be quite firm, fleshed and pleasant. I've designed this particular dish to celebrate summer, it's high summer, the beautiful fresh vegetables of peas, carrots, asparagus, mange too, the fresh herbs of mint and things of that kind and spinach. I've made over here some little packages of fennel, carrot and celery and here little packages of mange too, sugar peas, um, asparagus, spring onions and green beans and some splendidly fresh bean sprouts. Now, in keeping with the spirit of summer, the longest summer of love, as I remembered in 1960-something or another, when I couldn't even afford to go to San Francisco, and this lot had been here for 25 years, some of them, amazing. Don't know where they get the money from. Never mind. So we put our packages of vegetables into the steamer. These were going a little bit later because they'll be quicker to cook. We'll put the lid onto that, steam away for a while. I will have... Um, some of this splendidly advertised wine. And you can look at something else while I go for a walkabout. Anyone can wander into Freetown and buy hashish, and if you happen to live there, marijuana plants are delivered to your doorstep. Yes. The community settled here 30 years ago, and now boasts several hundred residents, mostly smashed out of their brains, living in what was an army barracks. I have to make a sauce, which is going to be a green pea and mint sauce made with the fish stock and pureed green peas. So first I need to tip all of that into there. That goes into there. Then I just have a little bit of this liquid back, like that. Mix in my puree of green peas. a bit of a whisk. Uh, 
absolutely excellent. A little bit of pepper. Then some little pieces, or some, which I've prepared down here, is butter with chopped fresh mint in it. Just chopped fresh mint and butter. That goes into the pan here. We whisk that in, along with a little bit of cream. Now, the butter and the cream will liaise to make this sauce very, very rich. Right. Now, we'll arrange a piece of fish on here, another piece on there. Over to here, Vlad, please. I have to take out my steamed vegetables. Always be very careful when lifting the lid off a steamer because it can seriously damage your body. The steam is very, very hot indeed. Lift these out. Beautifully steamed summer vegetables in little packets coming onto the plate. One green one, one red one, and the bean sprouts one. We'll take off the strings, then a little bit of our pea sauce. I think I'll do that with a ladle. And then, to stay totally Scandinavian, some very, very thinly grated fresh horseradish sauce goes on top of the turbot and a little bit on the salmon and a little bit of fresh mint around everywhere. Where was it you said the pipe shop was? Kronberg Castle is located at the narrow sound separating Denmark from Sweden. This fortified Renaissance castle is 400 years old, and except for occasional wars against Sweden, its main purpose was to control the pirates and smugglers as they made their way through the narrow inlet. Large parts of Shakespeare's Hamlet takes place in the castle. In his play, the young Prince of Denmark is commanded by the ghost of his father to revenge his death. The murderer is in fact Hamlet's uncle, Claudius, who is married to the Queen, Hamlet's mother. As you know, Hector, it ends dramatically with the deaths of the main protagonists. This place is massive, with over a hundred rooms. The heating bills must have cost an arm and a leg and you'll need a compass to find the kitchens. Welcome to Kronberg, a staggeringly interesting castle, which is sadly empty inside, but it is a magnificent place, immortalized by the bard in one of his plays. So that's about history and art all over and done with. This is, although it might not look like it in the program, the second time I've used this funny machine. The first or the next time that I used it, it didn't work. And today is Sunday and the crew expressed a desire to have a simple Sunday lunch. So I'm going to prepare them some roasted, wood roasted vegetables and some little partridges in this terrifying machine. So I'm going to drench these peppers, garlics, leeks, aubergines and courgettes with a lot of olive oil and onions courgettes onions red and green and yellow peppers and a lot of olive oil a huge amount of not a huge amount but quite a lot of salt some good fresh thyme and some fresh rosemary And then some splendid little partridges with some good Danish fat 
bacon on top, or baconless fat, or fatless bacon, whatever you like to call it. They go onto there like that. I am told by my foodie friends in London right now, roasting over wood fires is all the rage. So we'll have a go at it here. We cover this whole thing with a bit of tin foil. into this demon machine, which is simply filled with charcoal, and somehow try to get this thing in here. Right, wood mark 750, lid goes down, and since that's going to take I don't know, an hour or two, I'm off with a couple of improving books, Hamlet by Shakespeare and The Princess and the Pea by Hans Christian Andersen and a bottle of wine. A man may fish with the worm that hath et of a king, and eat the fish that hath fed of the worm. Eric Cantona, Peter Sellers, me? Yes, it was. I had a go anyway. Good. Well, that was invigorating, I can say, and very interesting. The Princess and the Pea is actually easier to comprehend than uh, Hamlet. In mind. I guess you already knew that. So, this is my wood roasted vegetables and partridges, which I think under the circumstance burgers are pretty jolly good. Little last little grinder pepper and stuff over that. So that's what the boys are having for their lunch today. But because I was so frightened it wouldn't work, I prepared something else for them as well something which the Danes do really, really, really well is a wonderful loin of pork. Now this is probably going to burn right through my hand because it's been in the oven for a couple of hours. Holy Moses! Pork roasted with apples and apricots and is now going to be having a little treatment with the old aquavit, some pork gravy and some apple sauce. Ah. So first things first. That will get all the lovely juices from the pork going. Then we'll pop in the pork gravy. The lovely caramelised apples. Just taste that. That is seriously, seriously wonderful. It makes a change from pickled cucumber and beetroot sandwiches for breakfast, I can assure you. If the Scandinavian winter is horrendous, the summers are glorious, and the Danish countryside is spectacularly flat. In fact, the highest landmark is 150 meters, and is called, of course, Sky Mountain. But even in my state, I could climb to the top and have light refreshment, of course. And talking of refreshments, I'm on my way to a cherry orchard, where the ripened fruit is used to make a cherry liqueur, a wonderful drink. I'm in this cherry orchard today to celebrate two things very close to the Danes' heart. One is smoked loin of pork, absolutely delicious meat. The Danes are huge eaters of pork, and back up to people who've had the one good thing they do with their roast pork, which we shan't be doing, but they have that much fat on the top, and they roast it with smashing crackling on it, and it's really superb, but so is this dish. The other thing is, we're gonna celebrate this cherry liqueur, which most of us only drink at Christmas times but it does make an excellent sauce with cherries and things. So, we'll start cooking it. A bit of butter into the pan. First of all. And we'll pop our little slivers of loin of smoked pork in there gently to cook for a moment or two. A little bit of pepper. These need only very lightly cooking because they are already smoked. And in with them, we'll add just a little bit of chopped shallot. Right. 
turn that up to maximum, get a bit more heat in there. Once the meat is sealed, a little bit of salt on. Just a little tiny bit like that. Sip of my iced tea. Which really is iced tea. It's a new thing. You can get it in sort of um, sachet things here in Scandinavia. It's rather good. Right, now, this is the bit that I always enjoy. A little bit of the old... Oh, it's very hot. <laughs> now, so the meat doesn't stew, we take the meat out at this stage, pop it onto our plate, and just reduce the alcohol down a little. And into that, we tip some red wine sauce. And as you know, these days, you don't have to sit up for hours making demi-glazes and things like that. You can quite comfortably buy them from the supermarkets, and very good they are too. And that's where this one came from. So a little bit of veal wine sauce. You could use chicken as well for pork. Then we pop in some cherries and their juice. These are beautiful, slightly bitter cherries, but they're wonderful, wonderful flavour. Let's test that. That could do with a little bit of pepper and a little bit of fresh thyme. Turn that right down to low to let it reduce nicely. Then as an accompaniment, at the same time as the cherries here in Denmark, we get these wonderful little chanterelles. So we're going to have a bit of pasta and chanterelles to go with this dish. So into the wok, I'll put some olive oil. Just a little, ooh, just a little. Pop in some of the mushrooms. A few chopped shallots, a little bit of garlic, and we'll stir fry that just for a second or two. It's quite strange because sort of autumn and summer seem to arrive at the same time over here. We wouldn't normally, in the United Kingdom at least, or France or wherever, be picking mushrooms till well into September, but they happen here much earlier. And very, very fine they are too. A little bit of pre-cooked fresh pasta, cold. Into that we'll add some fresh rosemary. A good grind of pepper. And a few chives. onto the plate. No, we won't. We'll put it into this dish separately there. We'll get a better good shot of that. It's a very, very pleasant accompaniment for this dish. Then, all we have to do now, let's turn that off so I don't get burnt. I was, um, I'm a bit wibbly wobbly today, I have to tell you, because I did a most extraordinary thing last night. The reason I'm a bit sort of down is I had a really amazing night out. In the hotel where we're staying was Michael Jackson's chauffeur. And we were chatting and, you know, he seemed to like my programmes and I quite like Michael Jackson. So he gave us some very, very privileged tickets. Numbered tickets right in front of the stage, went backstage afterwards, met all the boys. Michael didn't turn up, but everybody else did, the band did. And it really was a sensational show. And I take back everything I've said about him in the past because he was brilliant. A little bit of lemon zest. A quick wipe of all the splashes. There, that's my little snack for today. I've moved to northern Denmark, to the island of Moors in the fjord that makes its way right through the middle of the country. My producer was mumbling something about insurance, but I insisted on driving this cart myself. If I may say so, my dear Hector, I took to driving my Icelandic ponies with ease. I'm travelling through the farm Skaragard, now run as a museum, full of old wagons and machinery. They also like to keep the local traditions of cheese making. 
Jolly good too, it was a far cry from the frozen pizzas and Big Macs we had to have for lunch. But my latest chum Anton invited me to collect the eel catch in the museum's pond. These freshwater eels, if we weren't about to cook them of course, would migrate thousands of miles to breed. Travelling at night overland to the nearest river, then out to the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean, they lay their eggs three to four hundred metres down in the ocean. The young then make their way back to the same rivers, lakes and ponds, and the cycle starts over. I have to say, this yep. is an absolutely yeah. lyrical way to spend an August Denmark morning fishing or netting eels. I'm going to take them back to the farm. I'm going to cook them with garlic, with onions, with bacon and with red wine. It's, this is just a delight, an absolute delight. Eels are highly esteemed in Northern Europe and I assure you they taste delicious. Right, a fabulous location, a sunny day and some really superb spanking fresh eels which I'm going to cook in red wine, bacon, onions, garlic and of course, as usual, a little bit of aquavit with some polenta pancakes with red cabbage. But have a look at the ingredients first of all please, lad, so we can see them. Some little chunks of skin deal which we caught about half an hour ago. Some baby onions, I've already started to brown those because they take quite a long time to cook. Some bits of bacon some fresh ordinary mushrooms, a bit of parsley, some carrots, some tomato puree, some morils. Now these are bottled and dry, or dried and uh, soaked. Bay leaves, garlic, a bit of aquavit, some red wine, butter and flour. It's all terribly, terribly simple. But the first thing we need to do is get the bacon frying into this pan here. So we'll let the bacon take a little bit of colour. Now, while those are browning there, we'll cook off our mushrooms separately in the pot to your right there, Vlad. Let those cook away gently. Now, as soon as the bacon has started to brown, which it is now, we can add some little finely diced carrot. Next thing to do is put the eel into a little bit of flour like so. Shake that around, just lightly flour it. Then each piece will shake off and pop into the pot with the bacon fat and the carrots. Season those with a little bit of salt and a bit of pepper, pepper first, and then some salt, a bit more butter, and brown the eels very lightly in the hot, the hot delicious butter. That's looking good already. I can tell you driving horses, and uh, which I've never done before, driven a pair of uh, Icelandic ponies with a tra trap across the fields and catching eels is terribly thirsty work, so a little slurp is always a nice thing to have. Right, now some garlic in with the eels. A bay leaf or two. Quite importantly next, a little bit of the old uh, aquavit, something I like celebrating here. flavours it extremely nicely, it's warming on a cold chilly afternoon and of course makes the handle impossible to pick up so don't forget to use a cloth. Uh, now a little tomato puree goes into there, a little bit of parsley goes into there and then a good dollop of red wine, some fresh thyme, goes in like that, uh, in this still hot saucepan here we'll continue cooking our little onions. And the morils. 
they too can go in. Now we let that simmer now very gently for about 15 or 20 minutes. And now I've just got two more things to do before we can serve the whole thing. One is to warm a little bit of red cabbage in my pot here. This is already cooked, but this is just to, to warm it through. And the next thing is to cook some polenta cakes. Now, polenta you can buy at Semolina, and you can buy it anywhere. You can get instant stuff this day. You just boil it up with water, lay it out flat, and cut out little shapes like that. But to make this more interesting, I flavoured it with cinnamon. So we're going to fry one of those in the butter now. So it's nice and crispy on the outside. I can turn it over. Way there we are. We'll just fry that until it's nice and crispy. In the meantime, we'll have a bit of eel on the plate. You remember that this was cooked with little pieces of bacon, with carrot, with thyme, with parsley, with garlic, red wine. That's the first little bit of our dish. Sorry about my shadow, the sun is very inconveniently. That's the eel bit. Then we'll add some of the... Oh, oh you've got to be tough these days. Then we'll add some of the little fried onions, the morils and the ordinary mushrooms. Just cooked in butter with salt and pepper and fresh thyme. That's that little bit done. Then hopefully our polenta cake is now well, well toasted. So the polenta cake goes on there. The polenta, of course, is a very starchy thing. It takes the place of potatoes or of rice or of pasta. Pasta or potatoes will go equally well with this dish, but I thought what day is it? Oh dear, it must be Mondays, therefore it's Denmark, therefore it's polenta. Then on top of that, we add a little bit of cooked red cabbage on top of the polenta cake. And finally, because Denmark is very famous for its dairy products, we'll use some good Danish cream on the top of that. And that is my little celebration of the name of this wonderful place which I've completely forgotten. But I know it's on a lovely lake on an island somewhere in the north of Denmark. It's a brilliant place. Look at the dish.